This is John Quinn, and this is Law Disrupted. And today we're going to be talking about the criminal prosecutions of former president Donald Trump. And really, we're uh, from a legal standpoint, and really from a lot of different standpoints, we're on uncharted territory here. This is the first time a criminal charge has ever been brought against a U.S. president or a former U.S. president, so far as I'm aware. And we're going to have a chance to talk about issues such as whether this is politically motivated, uh, what the potential exposure is for President Trump. Uh, you know, some of these charges bring very long prison terms. At 77, if he's convicted of any of these, it's possible he could die in prison. It raises a lot of interesting questions. You know, for example, federal law mandates that a former president gets Secret Service protection for life without exception. If he goes to jail, does that mean he's going to have Secret Service protection in jail? We're going to talk about the different, the four different indictments, the charges, the potential defenses, the lawyers and judges involved, and maybe I'll, we'll touch on the likelihood of convictions, what the defenses likely are, how strong the prosecution's cases are. We'll also obviously touch on the implications for the 2024 presidential elections, issues such as if he's indicted, can he be elected president? If he's convicted, can he be elected president? And we'll obviously touch on the broader political and policy implications on the longer term from this unprecedented set of circumstances. You know, we've never had this before in this country. There are countries in the world where it's pretty routine that you prosecute the last president. It happens a lot uh, in South Korea, for example. It, it happens sometimes in France. It happens in Brazil. It's never happened in our country. And we have with us today two of my partners who are eminently well qualified to discuss this subject. We have my partner, Steve Madison, who's based in our Los Angeles office. Steve is a former uh, assistant United States attorney, was a prosecutor for many years. We also have with us Robert Zink, who's based in our Washington, D.C. office. Rob was formerly head of the fraud section of the United States Department of Justice. So, gentlemen, welcome to Law Disrupted, and thank you very much for discussing with us this very important topic this important topic, historic topic, really, of the pr criminal prosecutions of our former president. And let's talk, There's there are two federal prosecutions, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Georgia. And let's begin with those. And Rob, maybe you can kind of give us a picture. You pick which one you want to discuss first, either the Washington one or the Georgia one, and give us kind of a rundown of what the charges are, what the president is faced with there, and what that looks like in terms of what the government must prove and what President Trump's defenses likely will be and what the, you know, to the extent you can handicap the strength of those defenses and the strength of the case, we're very interested in hearing your opinion. Sure. Well, uh, thank you, John, for having, having me on. It's a pleasure to be here with, uh, with you and Steve. So let's start with the, the first federal indictment returned by a federal grand jury in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida. The original indictment was returned in June of this year. And then a superseding indictment, it's an indictment with additional charges, was returned in July of this year, charging uh, President Trump, uh, Walt Menuda, and Carlos Oliveria with various federal crimes, which I'll detail in a second. But just to set the stage for our listeners, obviously, President Trump needs no introduction. Um, Walt Menuda uh, was a valet employed by the United States Navy who is assigned to President Trump. He's colloquially called his body man. He's the individual who is, um, was at the time of President Trump's presidency, the guy who followed him around everywhere and, and um, enjoying some of those same responsibilities after the president left office. So he's been charged as well, uh, along with an individual named Carlos Oliveria, who is the essentially the, the property manager of Mar-a-Lago. That's the resort where President Trump resides at various points um, during the year. So it's a three defendant indictment charging these three individuals with very serious federal felonies, which I'll detail in a second. A couple critical things to know before we talk about the charges and the underlying conduct. Um, President Trump was charged in the Southern District of Florida, which, as we all know, went red, went Republican um, for him and went Republican um, against President Biden in the last election. That's kind of point number one. Uh, point number two is 
uh, as lawyers know, many law, non-lawyers don't know this, there are different divisions, different courthouses that reside in certain federal districts. And the specific division where President Trump will be tried is called the Fort Pierce Division. Again, that's a division within the federal district, Southern District of Florida, at issue. The reason that may be of some importance is the Fort Pierce Division historically has trended very conservative. And um, you know, you would hope politics don't play a role in any federal criminal trial, but common sense and intuition tells us that it might. So it's a it's a, just an important data point for for folks to know about. The judge in the case, um, Judge Cannon, uh, was appointed by President Trump. Um, he's 42 years old, uh, was an associate at a very good law firm called Gibson Dunn, and then served for a better part of seven years as a assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of Florida. That's the district um, where President Trump is being prosecuted. So at the end of the day, you have a, a pretty conservative division where he's going to be tried with presumably conservative jurors. A, um, a judge who was appointed by the president himself. And, um, you know, all of the pomp and circumstance that comes with a, a prosecution of this type. So turning now to the to the kind of charges at issue, there are really, John, two buckets of charges. Uh, the first bucket is the uh, unlawful retention of classified documents. President Trump's been charged with 32 counts of withholding or maintaining unlawfully maintaining documents that have been marked privilege for national security purposes. Does that mean there's 32 documents? I was, I was going right to that, John. Yeah. So the 32 counts map back to individualized documents. Okay. That bear the classified markings that were allegedly uh, unlawfully maintained by, by the president. So that's kind of bucket number one. Um, bucket number two is a hodgepodge of obstruction charges relating to false certifications to the FBI that all the documents have been produced in connection with relevant investigations. There are allegations and charges that documents were moved, physically moved at the direction of the president to prevent attorneys from getting their hands on the documents and producing them. And there are charges related to attempts to delete footage at Mar-a-Lago um, showing uh, attempts to move documents in advance. of From cameras that were in place in rooms where the documents were located. Correct. Correct. And those, the video obstruction charges, I'll call them, are, are were the subject of the superseding indictment in July. So just to, to, to bring it back home, it's, we're in Southern District of Florida, and we got a whole bunch of charges, two categories, hold on to stuff you're not supposed to, the classified documents, and then obstructing the federal government's ability to get their hands on those documents. Now, the, I mean, the first set of charges, I mean, for somebody, this is not my area, as you gentlemen know, I mean, same like black and white. If you're not supposed to have classified information and you've got it at your home after you're president, what's there left to argue about? Great question, John. I actually think these are the easier to defend because the, the mens rea, the mental state required um, to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt is willful. Uh -huh. So the government is going to have to prove that President Trump knew what he was doing was unlawful. So in other words, they have to prove that he knew the law was he should not have these documents and he kept them anyway. Yes, with, with a nuance. He doesn't know this, need to know the specific law at issue, just that it was unlawful as a general proposition for him to maintain. And uh, there's a case which I think um, Steve can, can talk about in some detail whereby a Judge Berman Jackson back in 2012 held under a different statute, so it's a different statutory regime, um, the Presidential Records Act, that the president has the unilateral authority upon taking documents to render them personal as opposed to presidential. All right, so that's, that's personal as opposed to pre presidential. It's not unclassified as opposed to classified. Correct. But it's, it's sort of an, a, an analogy, if you will, that might, a case that kind of might give him a good faith belief that in reliance on this, I thought it was, uh, you know, I could render them essentially unclassified or okay for me to have possession of just by taking possession of them. Correct. Yeah, if I could, John, and it's great to be with you and, and Rob as well. I, the, the case Rob's referring to is the infamous Clinton sock drawer case. Clinton sock. So there are documents. I'm guessing you're going to tell me there were documents or other things that President Clinton kept in his sock drawer. It's even better than documents. It's tape recordings 
which of course harkens back to Watergate for those of us old enough to remember the, the Nixon tapes. But in that case, Taylor Branch, famous historian and author, interviewed President Clinton in a series of lengthy recorded interviews while Clinton was president. And President Clinton, after he left the White House, kept the tapes and kept them in his sock drawer. And uh, a, I think it was a conservative think tank found out about this and sued the National Archives, claiming that these were presidential records that uh, the archives were required to compel the former president to return. And of course, uh, dirtying up President Clinton in the process. And this is sort of classic Trump that throw up uh, these alternate realities and to cite and point back at the, the Clinton software case, they're completely different in the sense that um, that case involved presidential records, not classified documents. Uh, there was never an issue about classified material in the Taylor Branch tapes. The book was ultimately, ultimately published, by the way, I think it's called Wrestling with History, the Clinton tapes or the oral history. Um, but uh, I, you know, I agree with uh, Rob on the Florida case that it's uh, easy to defend. And, you know, we're always very aware of the judge and the jury. And so there you are in Northern District of Florida, a very conservative, you know, pro-Trump uh, sort of populace in terms of potential jury. Um, he'll have some mental defenses and good old nullification. The idea that the jury just will refuse to convict, even if they understand deep down that He's good for it. So this all goes to mens rea. Did, did he know it was unlawful? And what you're telling us uh, is that there is some precedent that he could rely on, even if it doesn't really map on to this particular case. I mean, ha has, has he or his lawyers actually invoked this case yet in any filing or any argument in the court? Is that already in play publicly before the court? They have. They have. Um, it's been briefed in a couple different contexts. So I think we can expect it to be one of several legal defenses that are that are posited by the Trump defense team. Um, John, I should probably note also that to, as to that second bucket of charges, the obstruction charges, the defense here, I think, if I were the defense attorney, is a little bit different. Based on my reading of the indictment, it appears that the federal government um, appropriately it took sworn testimony from witnesses. But it, it is also, at least my quick view, that there's likely not a pled cooperating witness on the obstruction conduct for the federal government. So what that means as a practical matter is they might have a tough time narrating um, the obstruction conduct. They undoubtedly got bits and pieces from, say, former attorneys. But those those sworn statements, if they're grand jury, and I'm sure many of them were, were not subject to cross-examination. So many of the witnesses that form the basis of the obstructive conduct charges um, will be, you know, subject to very, very vigorous cross-examination. And these witnesses are, are likely to be very favorable for the president, just on a personal and professional level. So I'd be interested to see how these witnesses fare up on cross-examination. So in other words, the witnesses to the idea that he moved documents to different locations so they couldn't be found, or that he had tapes erased, uh, the prosecution may have some challenges in getting the direct testimony establishing those facts, the predicate facts to the obstruction charges. Correct. And and look, that analysis changes altogether if either Mr. Nanuta or Mr. Oliveria decides to plead and cooperate with authorities. I think if, if that happens and there's corroboration for their testimony, there'll be there'll be difficult charges to defend. But if that doesn't happen, if there is no, you know, flipping is the term, but cooperation by the other co-defendants, it may well pose a, a, a pretty significant hurdle for the for the Justice Department. I mean, we often hear that the cover-up is is worse than the crime, and what I'm hearing you say is that the the document retention charges, the the uh, charges that started all this, that that's you, you, what I'm hearing is that you think that's very defensible. But the obstruction charges, depending upon whether there's cooperation or not, may be much harder to defend. And no, that's exactly right. And I. I I'll say this with the caveat that everything with respect to President Trump, you kind of is, is new. But if this is an ordinary case, I think it is unlikely the department would charge anybody with the unlawful retention of classified documents without other aggravating factors like the obstructive conduct, the alleged obstructive conduct we, we see here. Right. Well, I mean, the um, supporters of President Trump and I think 40 percent of the population, I read, believes that the last the last election was stolen. 
he has a lot of supporters and they're going to say i assume uh look he's not the first you know president or former government official to hang on to classified information uh that this is a case of selective prosecution that example is being made of him uh for political purposes does any of that get into the courtroom well it's up to judge cannon but i i think i think in a case like this any wise judge is 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 likely to allow the defendant and defense team wide berth with respect to the introduction of evidence. So my guess would be a lot of stuff that may be close to the line is going to be coming in. So it, it may well be the case that, that kind of information comes in. I agree with Rob on that. You know, it's hard to imagine a, a show trial like this if it got that far where uh, President Trump wouldn't testify. And at that point, it will be you know free ranging, especially with the mental elements that are required. That I, I would think a court would be um, darn near powerless to to not let him talk about his state of mind. And as you know, he, he'll wax uh, rhapsodic about all the other uh, transgressions of the other side. Right. So, do you do you think in this case, uh, given the mens rea issue, it's it's highly likely that the the president will take the stand? I would, but Rob, we haven't talked about that. <laughs> Again, just armchair quarterback. If there is on the you can get in the mens rea evidence from another witness, potentially, if if that witness exists. And so I don't think it's necessary that the president testifies to establish kind of the mens rea defense. But to Steve's point, depending on your voter makeup, you might want President Trump to take the stand, look the jurors in the eyes and try to persuade them himself. And it, it might ultimately be the most effective defense strategy. I mean, he's a persuasive, charismatic guy. Uh, he he could, I could see him being a, a powerful witness in his own defense, especially if the judge doesn't have control in the courtroom. And that's hard to imagine, you know, how, how the judge keeps him between the rails. Yep. Well, you, you know, John, to that point, Tom Barrick, um, a, a senior advisor to President Trump, was charged with um, various federal felonies, including lying to the FARA. Foreign, foreign agent uh, registration act. Correct. It's 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 actually more serious than that. They charge him with with um, acting as an agent of a foreign government directly. We did a podcast with the defense counsel in that case. Oh, really? Well, it was a very effective defense strategy. It ultimately came down to Mr. Barrick took the stand and um, was incredibly persuasive. Yeah. I think everybody in that room um, was persuaded by his version of events. So it's it's a strategy with public officials who are charismatic and have the human touch that, that can be very effective. Okay, well, that's the federal case in Florida, and it sounds like the uh, the class, the underlying, the principal classified documents case is maybe a relatively easy case to defend. The obstruction case, maybe not. It depends. The other federal cases in Washington D.C. Uh, Rob, tell us about that case. Sure. So President Trump himself alone was uh, charged in. The District of Columbia this year with four federal felonies. They um they are a Klein conspiracy, which is a shorthand for conspiracy to defraud uh, the United States government. Count two is conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, and that was Congress's certification of the electoral vote on January sixth. Obstruction itself, not conspiracy, but obstruction itself for uh, President Trump's alleged attempts to uh, interfere with the certification count. Congress's certification count on the 6th, and then a crime called conspiracy against rights, which is is new to me. Um, it's it's a statute that is not employed frequently in these, in white collar cases at least. And it's a, it's charges that President Trump um, used intimidation and in the exercise of individuals' right to vote. And I think the, the plain English version of that is there was interference with the um, electors' ability to properly certify the votes in their states and before um, the United States Congress on January 6th. The judge in the case is Tanya Chutkin. Unlike the case charged in SDFL, that's the Southern District of Florida, the case charged here in DC um, is before a judge who's appointed by um, President Obama, and she is certainly not a Republican. Um, the voting population of District Columbia is widely reported to be over 90% Democrat. So you have kind of a mirror image of 
the, uh, the judge and the jury in D.C. as opposed to the Southern District of Florida. So that's kind of the basics of the case. And I'll talk briefly about the, the underlying misconduct. It is it is vast, really, really vast. Um, the, the grand jury and the government charges um, kind of five or six different buckets of, of misconduct by, by the president. Now, the first is in committing those four alleged crimes. The president made publicly made false accusations. The election had been stolen. It's kind of bucket number one. Bucket number two, he he and others attempted to interfere with and get state officials to change the electoral votes in certain states, including Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. The third bucket of alleged misconduct is um, an attempt, allegedly, by President Trump and others to submit falsified documents, false electoral certifications to the United States Congress in or around January 6th in an attempt to inhibit, delay, overturn the, uh, interfere with the vote by Congress to certify the Electoral College. So there, there are other, three other buckets of misconduct I should highlight just very briefly. The first is allegations that President Trump unlawfully enlisted the support of, or attempted to elicit the support of Vice President Pence in failing to certify the vote on January 6th. Um, the President Trump also unlawfully and improperly enlisted the support of senior DOJ officials to lean on state officials to um, change the electoral counts in certain states. And finally, that the president uh, took advantage of um, a very upset group of individuals who had come to the White House on January 6th and used them to, in an attempt to interfere with the proceedings on January 6th, the congressional proceedings to certify certify the vote. When you say people who came to the White House, who are you referring to? I'm talking about the, the individuals who um, came to the White House uh, where President Trump made remarks to them about what had happened, and many of whom then uh, marched on the Capitol and have been convicted of trespass and obstruction of justice. Okay. I, I didn't realize that there are actually some of these Proud Boys characters who had come to the White House, heard a speech, and then decided to storm the Capitol building. There, it is... John, it is certainly true that many of the individuals who were charged in connection with the January 6 cases were at the White House and then eventually migrated to the Capitol. All right. So as you say, these sound like very uh, broad, uh, wide ranging charges. I would think, well, my reaction to this is first, First Amendment. I mean, he can say the election was stolen. Uh, this is wrong. This should be changed. Uh, if he believes in good faith, you know, again, I assume there's a mens rea requirement here because we're talking about crimes. If he genuinely believes that, he could de direct people to up to a point to take certain actions. Uh, so on the one hand, I, I would think that there's a path here for uh, him to get an acquittal on this. Uh, but on the other hand, the charges are so wide ranging and seemingly amorphous in some respects that I think they probably, um, there's a lot of ways to lose, right? I mean, there's a lot of territory that you have to cover if you're the defense here. Yeah, but this, this, I completely agree. This one is, this one is um, equal parts defensible and incredibly challenging. And uh, the president's team has been wise to try to transfer proceedings out of DDC. Um, there's an old saying at the department that if your opening statement is good enough, it doesn't matter what the crime is. You can convict anybody of anything. And you know when I read this indictment, there's just a lot of stuff in there, mm -hmm. and a lot of, there's a lot of stuff, and it, it certainly reads, you know, bad. But what I struggle with is mapping it back to elements, the elements of the charged offenses. You know, it it may well be a defense strategy that that a lot of this is just surplusage. That's a term right. in in the criminal world for irrelevant prejudicial information that it really has no bearing right. on the underlying elements of the offense. What what you're saying is is contrary to what we hear about the, the prosecutor here and the prosecution, I think the man's name is Jack Smith. Is he the prosecutor? Yes. Uh, that, you know, it's lean, it's mean, it's pared down. Uh, you know, this is a, you know, very focused, at least I'm, this is just, I haven't read the indictment. You have. But from news reports, that's the portrayal we'll get, we get. But what I'm hearing for you is that it's, that's not fully accurate. 
Well, uh, let me say a couple of things. So Jack Smith is a cross with tremendous integrity. He's excellent among among the best that has ever, at least in my generation, been in the department. So um, he's excellent in every respect. And it, it is true that the indictment is lean and mean with respect to defendants. I think um, Steve's going to talk about the Georgia indictment, which is decidedly different in terms of number of defendants. And the number of charges in the January the DDC indictment is are, are pretty few. There's only four. Kind of my what I'm simply pointing out is the the breadth of the conduct at issue. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to me to to map back to the elements of the offense. Now, if you're in front of a judge that's going to let everything in, it's a brilliant it's a brilliant prosecution strategy, right? It all comes in, and a jury who may be predisposed to not like President Trump hears about all of this bad stuff, which may have arguable marginal relevance to the elements, and it's an easy conviction. If you're in front of a different judge. The judge might take the prosecution to task on going through each and every paragraph of the, of the indictment with an understanding and explication from the government about how it's relevant to the elements of the offense. So a lot of this is going to come down to Judge Shutton's view of, of relevance and, you know, what the elements of the underlying offenses are. So how do you handicap this? So the whole thing is a little bit ironic to me because I think the setting aside guilt or innocence, just looking at the charges and the allegations, the indictment. I think the stronger of the two indictments is the Southern District of Florida indictment. Um, I think it's also the most challenging to win for the federal government. Yeah. On, on the allegations and on the charges, I think the DC indictment is much more of a stretch. Um, because at the end of the day, if you can show that President Trump directed people to destroy videotape of an impending search warrant or in connection with the grand jury subpoena, it's, that's bad. That's obstruction. Right. Um, so that, that should be easy to prove. But in DDC, like I said before, the charges are quite novel and wide ranging. But you have a, a court and a voting population that, you know, might not care as much about the legal nuances of the elements. Uh -huh. OK. Uh, all right, Steve, let's turn to you and talk about the, the two state indictments, the one in New York, which I think was the first of all these uh, criminal prosecutions that were brought in New York State, and then the one most recently in Georgia. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting and uh, sort of following on to your last uh, exchange there with Rob that, uh, you know, when I first looked at these state cases, uh, especially Georgia, I, I thought, you know, they've really jumped the shark. Uh, I mean, by the time the Georgia indictment came in last week, just last week, you know, we had three pending prosecutions, two federal by special counsel Jack Smith. You know, these these matters do involve national elections. Trump was the president. We know all about January 6th. And you have the New York case, which I'll talk about in a moment. But as I've looked at it more closely, I, I think I may have been wrong. And uh, And the reason I say that is that these, both the, the New York and the Georgia cases sort of widened the aperture on Trump. In, a, in the New York case, sort of temporally, because it deals with conduct uh, before he was president. And in the case of Georgia, it really opens your eyes to the intentionality and uh, breadth and scope of the alleged conspiracy to undermine our democracy and our elections. Uh, so let me let me just dive in. The, the New York case was the first, as you mentioned, and I would also ask you to think about the uh, impact that these state investigations and ultimate charges may have had on DOJ, because Jack Smith is a special counsel, but he's part of DOJ. And, you know, up until the New York indictment, not much was happening uh, federally. Uh, the, the sort of department was wringing its hands and not really sure how to treat Trump. You had all, of course, the Mueller investigation and the, the various congressional. You know, Trump's the only president in history to be impeached twice, um, but not removed from office. So along comes Alvin Bragg. He's the Democratic uh, district attorney, if you will, state's attorney for New York. And even there, the, the charges are come in in May of uh, 2023. But even before that, remember, uh, when he came into office, he poo-pooed the, the Trump investigation, probably for many of the reasons that I, I was mentioning. And, and you'll recall that there was this sort of very unusual 
incident where two senior prosecutors, Mark Pomerantz and Casey Dunn, did sort of a noisy withdrawal. They resigned their positions as assistant district attorneys uh, in New York. And they publicly said the reason was that Alvin Bragg, their new boss, was not going to follow through on the investigation that they had conducted uh, in the Trump matter. And at some point after that, Bragg did a U-turn and and then announced the charges in May, as I said. Now, this New York case is called uh, mostly the hush money case, because this harkens back to a time when Trump was only a candidate, not president. And it involves this sort of fixer facilitator, Michael Cohen, who was a lawyer and a longtime accomplice of Trump's. And essentially, the allegations are 34 counts of falsifying business records under New York law. And the idea is that the Trump campaign had a a, a practice called catch and kill. They called it that, catch and kill. If there was negative information out there, they would catch it and kill it. And the way they would do that, by and large, was payoffs. And so the main sort of centerpiece of this uh, charge is that working through the National Enquirer, uh, a a $150,000 payment was made to a former Playmate uh, and Playboy model named Karen McDougal to keep her quiet. And then Michael Cohen paid $130,000 to Stormy Daniels of uh, the infamous uh, Stormy Daniels, Michael Avenatti, and all, who also claimed that she had had a sexual relationship with, with Trump. And the idea was, We'll pay them off, keep them quiet, according to the charges. And, you know, Cohen has pled guilty to this. He pled to six or eight counts and served a three-year prison sentence. That was for, for his participation in the payoff of Stormy Daniels? Correct. Uh, that was, I think that was five or six of the, of the charges. And uh, it was a tax matter in his case, and he was convicted federally. But uh, in the state case, the idea is that There were uh, false business records in the sense that Trump was paying these as so-called legal fees, claiming that they were legal fees, but in fact, they were payoffs and and a reimbursement for the the hush money. Now, a couple of really interesting things about this uh, case. First of all, the feds declined to prosecute this very case. They they declined. uh, And... For good reason, the the federal government brought a very similar case against former presidential candidate and U.S. Senator John Edwards that you may recall, where John Edwards had had uh, a child out of wedlock at a time when his wife was very sick. She later died of cancer. And uh, he, too, had used campaign funds through his uh, chief of staff or campaign manager to pay for the uh, expenses and the like of the child. And the government took the position that those payments were essentially campaign contributions, which weren't disclosed as such, or or campaign uh, expenses, if you will. And they lost that trial famously. It's very hard to prove that the central or primary motive for a payoff like that is campaign related. And that would be the element that they would have to prove in this uh, New York case. So, you know, the feds declined. It's a tough case. Um, But here again, show me the judge and I'll show you the law. Uh, Show me the jury in a jury trial and I'll I'll have a better sense. This is New York City, uh, probably a good jury pool for the, the prosecution. Now, there are a couple other things that we should talk about here because there is a concept that many of us are not intimately familiar with because it's rarely invoked. And that is the idea of removal to federal court of a criminal case. That's news to me that you could remove a federal court. Is it on grounds of diversity or what? No, it's actually, a, again, sort of an obscure uh, provision under Title 28. It was uh, adopted initially in uh, the War of 1812 and then amended. And the current version was, was uh, enacted in 1948. But the idea is... And it makes sense if you think about our republic and the sort of states and the, and the federal government. The idea is that no federal official should be held criminally responsible for carrying out his official federal duties uh, in a state prosecution. 
there you can think of lots of examples where um, state uh, prosecutors might be unhappy. Civil rights would be one, for example. Taxation might be another, where they might be unhappy with the uh, conduct of federal officials. And so uh, in Title 28, uh, essentially the judicial code, uh, is a provision that a federal official or one acting at the direction of a federal official in a matter that relates to their federal duties uh, can remove any criminal prosecution. So Trump tried this in the New York case. And the way you do it is you file a petition for removal in federal court, and then a federal judge uh, rules on that. And in that case, the judge uh, rejected his attempt to remove because he said he was a camp candidate, not an actual federal official at that time. And he famously said, you know, paying hush money to a porn star is not uh, defending the Constitution, which is sort of uh, one way of putting the, the subject matter requirement. You know, so he struck out on that. But um, so the case is headed to trial. It's set for March of next year in state court. But Alvin Bragg has said he's uh, open-minded about a continuance. He's not looking now to sort of be the at the head of the line. And I think many of us believe that, that this charge and the leaks about the Georgia investigation, which we can turn to now, really got DOJ uh, off the dime and spurred the Jack Smith charges. The the cases that Rob described so well, you know, the the Florida documents, classified documents case was in late July. And then early August, they were right back to back uh, came the, the January 6th the insurrection case against Trump. And, and by the way, on the insurrection case, you know, it's one defendant and many of us would not be surprised if there's a superseding indictment and other defendants are added, but that, that remains to be seen. Well, I mean, Steve, getting back to the New York State Court case, as I understand it, New York has kind of unusual law about books and records that if you maintain inaccurate books and records, that's some kind of free-floating misdemeanor. It's not like you submitted to the government for this, you did this. Right. There's some kind of a you know, in a vacuum, amorphous idea, if you have inaccurate big books and records, that's a misdemeanor. And what I understand is what gets this to a felony is there's also a principle or a law that, well, if you do inaccurate books and records in aid of a felony uh, or otherwise unlawful conduct, then that becomes a felony. And the theory was here, as I understand it, not that he used money you know, campaign funds per se, again, correct me if I'm wrong, to pay off Stormy Daniels. He used his money, but he paid her off in order to preserve his candidacy. And that, therefore, it was really in aid of his candidacy. That becomes a campaign finance violation because he didn't properly declare it. And that's how they get to the felon. Precisely. All right. So what, Steve, what I don't get here, is it seems like there's a lot of reasons other than wanting to preserve your candidacy that most men in this situation would want to keep Stormy Daniels quiet. Now, maybe maybe in the case of Donald Trump, you could, you know, would say maybe he doesn't care so much, you know, his wife or whatever, his family, whatever they may think of him, the other reasons why you might want to keep somebody quiet. But it seems to me that's kind of an obvious defense here. Well, on information and belief, you're right about what most men would feel in that situation. And and Trump certainly will not, uh, you know, hew to any one version of things. He'll he'll uh, take whatever suits him. And that is the argument that his lawyers have been making, that this was embarrassing. And you know, what, whatever his view, uh, you know, it's you could even quote Hillary Clinton, that nobody knows what's going on inside of a marriage except the two people in it. And so um, that certainly would be a lot to think about for reasonable doubt for jurors, because you're right, John, the government's theory here, what makes it a felony is essentially the campaign uh, related nature of the fraud. They were trying to protect the campaign. And that's a high standard as the John Edwards case proved with uh, those acquittals. All right. So if I'm, if I'm handicapping this one, uh, I'm thinking he, there's a good chance he's going to win that case. He'll get an acquittal in New York State Court. 
It's a tough case, uh, even though Michael Cohen. You mean for the prosecution, it's a tough case. Yes, excuse me, for the prosecution, it it is a, a tough case. And again, I think the biggest value may be that it was sort of the booster rocket maybe that got Jack Smith and the DOJ off the dime and then led to those cases, which probably should take uh, priority ultimately. Okay, let's talk, let's talk about, unless you have something else on that, I was going to turn to the uh, state court case in uh, Georgia. Yeah. The, the latest case. And I'll come back to the removal thing that I mentioned. So please remember that. Let's just put a pin in that. But so then last week, Georgia comes in. And, and here again, my initial reaction was, you know, they've really jumped the shark. You know, this sprawling indictment under Georgia law, uh, you know, 41 charges, 19 defendants, not just Trump, but, you know, they're the whole sort of Star Wars bar of Donald Trump uh, land. You know, Rudy Giuliani is there. This is going to be a circus. It, it's already a circus, John. Um, and sure enough, the uh, chief of staff for the president, Mark Meadows, has already filed a petition to remove. Now, these aren't cases that you find a lot of precedent for, but there's some reason to believe that if one defendant removes, the entire matter gets removed. Um, my sense, just sort of a federal court supervisory power would be that's not necessarily true. But I think many of us are expecting when Trump uh, ultimately appears later this week that he, too, will file a petition to remove. And so let's just drill down a little bit on that, because why would you want to remove a case from state court to federal court? Well, in Fulton County, it is a probably a very anti-Trump jury pool, and uh, you have. But uh, ironically, you have a state court judge there who's a Republican who has to run for re-election. If it's removed to federal court, now you're in the Northern District of Georgia, which tends to be pro-Trump politically, and so you're looking at a probably a better jury pool. But the judge has already been assigned. Um, because of the Meadows petition, and it's, I believe it's Steve Jones, who's a, a black uh, President Obama appointee. So, you know, you're sort of trading off there, perhaps, in terms of uh, just the forum, you know, the judge and the, the jury. Uh, a lot of media have commented that he wants to be in federal court, not state court, because he can get a federal pardon. And that is untrue. When you remove under this obscure Title 28 section, uh, the state charges are simply tried in federal court and the state pardon and commutation law also applies. So it's really like you remove to ensure a fair trial and the federal court presides over it, but all the other rules are the state rules in terms of the charges, the um, elements, and ultimately the sentence and pardon or even commutation. And in Georgia, it's it's really interesting. There is a, uh, you know, speaking now about pardons for a moment. In Georgia, there is a Republican governor, Brian Kemp, but he's one of the individuals that Trump tried to bully and strong arm into uh, finding, you know, fake electors or trying to find famously, you know, I need to find 11,000 votes. So uh, Kemp uh, is someone that Trump has ridiculed and attacked and blasted, uh, and so unlikely think he'll be of any help. And that might not matter anyway, because in terms of a pardon in Georgia under state law, the governor doesn't pardon anyway. An independent board appointed by the governor, but independent nonetheless, they have to vote and consider pardon requests. And get this, you can't even apply until you've served five years. <laughs> Amazing. So that's not a reason to remove. I think the decision there will be made much more around uh, timing of the trial and the jury pool and and the judge. Well, t tell us about the the charges there. How how is it different than Washington? They both seem to be directed to an effort to overturn the election. They are. And when I said widen the aperture, you know what it reminds us is that. Even though we talk about our federal elections for president, for example, the way our uh, democracy is set up is it really is the states that conduct the elections. You know, we saw that a little bit in Bush v. Gore. And then now in this case, and in the indictment, we really do see that the, the real 
machinery of democracy is run at the state level. And Trump and his cadre were very well aware of that. So they had this really organized campaign to reach into Georgia and try to um, threaten and intimidate and bully the elected and, and unelecteds there to do anything they could to essentially fabricate a picture that the election had been stolen and that Trump either had actually won or that it wasn't clear that he had. I mean, there's some allegations, some counts that relate to this place called Coffee County in Georgia, where they actually were trying to get at the voting machines to damage them so as to be, be able to say falsely that there was a problem with the voting machines. And some of those local electors are now uh, looking down the business end of this uh, federal, uh, excuse me, state criminal indictment. It's a RICO charge. You know, that's the one that was, this is the state analog, but, you know, that's what they use for the mob and the Cosa Nostra and all. But when you read the, the uh, allegations, Trump is alleged to have behaved very much like a mob boss, uh, although David Remnick in the uh, New Yorker today comments that he wasn't a very wise mob boss because usually those guys have someone else make those phone calls for them. And for sure, Meadows is in there and a, a DOJ lawyer named Jeff Clark, who is accused of fabricating um, bases to try to get higher ups in the Justice Department to intervene in the election. It really paints a pretty sordid tale and also uh, puts some meat on the bones of what we saw on TV on January 6th in terms of what was behind that, in terms of this sort of coordinated uh, campaign. So uh, now I have to say from a political and public policy perspective, though, I still think there's a view of all this that it's concerning for the future. Yeah, well, I mean, but before we get into that, yeah, you're handicapping of this Georgia case. I mean, what you're telling us, it's got very specific allegations instructing instructing people to damage voting machines. Yep. That that sounds that sounds pretty serious. And if you can prove that, uh, that sounds like a crime to me. No question. But um, beyond a reasonable doubt, and of course, unanimity is a constitutional requirement in criminal cases. Uh, I think in Fulton County, a, a prosecutor should be able to get a unanimous jury to convict. Uh, I'm not so sure if it's in federal court in the northern district of Georgia. You know, and again, there are a lot of legal moves and uh, motions and the like that have to unfold first. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Georgia, of course, the case was just filed. The defendants haven't all even appeared yet, so we don't have a trial date. Can you say whether or not the the alleged criminal conduct in the in the complaint in Georgia directed to overturning the election is more specific, more detailed, more multifarious than in Washington, than in the Washington case? I think it's, um, it's certainly a broader case in terms of the number of charges and the number of defendants, uh, principally. But I think you get the same picture from both of the cases or putting them together. You now get a fulsome view of what was happening sort of in the moment in D.C. and then behind the scenes with all of these machinations to try to create some basis to whip up uh, the, the populace, you know, as was happening. I mean, so any one of these could put Donald Trump behind bars for years, and he's got to run the table here. He's, he's got to win this four times. Um, I mean, if I were him, I'd be losing some sleep. It's interesting when the third charge uh, came in, the third indictment, I think he famously said, you know, one more indictment and my, my reelection is assured. Yeah. And, I mean, this guy really does double down uh, every time that you would think a rational person would engage in some introspection. And sure enough, you've seen the polls, right? I think right. he's still running at, you know, mid to high 40s at least. Uh, in terms of uh, his support in, in the Republican Party, at least. Uh, and, you know, these, you look at the press conference for Atlanta, you have a, an urban uh, woman of color district attorney. Uh, this is, this plays right into Trump's, you know, racist and demagogic uh, dog whistling, you know, about what's wrong with our country. Right. And so I, I am concerned. Uh, that this will divide us even further. 
but I'm also not so sure that this isn't uh, something that we have to stamp out in its entirety, and that may not happen until he's in an orange jump. You can see, you can see how uh, in the future, the historians writing about the history of this, there'll be plenty of room to characterize this. You know, on the one hand, here's a guy who ran amok, which completely out of control. On the other hand, here's a guy who had so alienated the Democrats. He was despised by the Democrats and they wrecked their revenge uh, the way they could, where they could. And in a sense, you could say both are true. No question. So which, which, how does this play out in terms of the time sequence? Uh, you know, which one is likely, in what way are they like, in, or in what order are they likely to go to verdict? So the federal indictments, the, the government in the, well, the court in Southern Florida has set a trial date for, for May of 2024. So that's kind of um, not in the middle, kind of at the tail end of primary season. Unclear whether that trial date's going to stick. Um, the Office of Special Counsel, Department of Justice, has asked for a trial date in the D.C. case in January of 2024. So that would be right before the beginning of primary season. The, the president's legal team has asked for a trial date of um, 2026. Um, so a couple quick notes on this. This is this is one area that is a little bit curious to me because in most white collar cases that I've been a part of, and I, I have one that I was a prosecutor in in 2017 that's still pending trial. Mm -hmm if you can believe it, in the Northern District of Georgia, of all places. Um, it's, it's pretty unusual in a major white collar case, certainly in the District of Columbia, to get the trial from indictment in August to January. It's, it's, in, it's exceedingly rare. You, know, you would think that in a case of this magnitude with the, the national import of what's at stake, in all of the discovery, that you know, getting it produced and logged and reviewed, it just seems to me would likely be impractical to get it done between August and January. So this is being rushed. This is going much faster than pr criminal prosecutions usually go. I, I am a little bit puzzled at why, um, at why the department would be, I don't, pushing might be the wrong word, but why they have suggested a January 2024 trial date, given A, the complexity of a white-collar case of this type, and B, the criminal defendant at stake here. You, you want to make sure everything is done perfect and above board to preserve a, a potential conviction you could get. Mm -hmm. um, so again, who knows what the judge will do? Um, Trump's asked for 2026, government's asked for January 2024. We'll see. Yeah. Well, I, I, I assume you can run for president, even be elected president if you're under indictment. I mean, can you be elected president if you're a convicted felon? You can. There's no impediment uh, there. Uh, there is a provision in the 14th Amendment that uh, post-Civil War, uh, you know, uh, initiative that provides that if you were part of an insurrection or a rebellion, i.e. originally a Confederate soldier, but not limited to that on its terms. And, uh, you know, Lawrence Tribe and, and John Luddick have written about this, uh, that, that that disqualifies you from president. So there's definitely some risk. Uh, for Trump in terms of the, I, I would say, the Washington case and the Georgia case. Can he be convicted while he's president? You know, so in other words, if none of these, if the cases aren't all gone, he's not all acquitted by, and he's elected, but one case goes to trial or more cases go to trial while he's a sitting president, can he be convicted while he's president? You want to take that first, Rob? Or I... <laughs> we don't know the answer. Yeah. Well, I'm going to answer because I do not know the answer. <laughs> I don't know either, but I'll take a crack at it. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I would say, you know, the DOJ has a, a, a policy in the in the justice manual that uh, sitting presidents will not be charged. They will not okay. charge a sitting president. But you're asking a different question. And I would imagine there's no legal impediment, although there would be a probably a forceful argument based on essentially executive privilege that that part of the executive privilege has to be, and we've seen this in cases um, before, where you know the, the full attention, the time and attention of the president should be devoted to carrying out his official duties. So you could imagine trying to defer the, the case. And of course, the other thing is, if we're talking federal, can Trump 
pardon himself. That still has never been resolved. Right. So it'd be an easy enough to take one swipe of the pen and just pardon oneself. If he was elected president, you'd think that would be an endorsement of at least, uh, you know, 50% of the country, that that would be okay. I'll say just a, a quick comical point. I mean, as, as, as you know better than I do, Steve, for an indicted defendant in the federal criminal process, they have to report to a uh, pretrial services officer. And it would be pretty comical, even if the indictments were pushed, President Trump as a sitting, if he was to be reelected as a sitting chief executive to have to report to pretrial services would be um, a, a pretty funny outcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, so this this all raises the question you start to raise, T, Steve, about what the policy. Is this is this good for our country? I mean, are we getting really going off track here? Uh, we talk about how divided we are and everything. Are we just throwing gasoline on the flames? Is the game worth the candle, even if you're a Democrat and you despise Donald Trump? I keep thinking back, you know, I lived through, I was in college at the time of Watergate. And uh, I remember Ford, I mean, like Nixon had the country just up in arms. And I remember Ford pardoning him and saying, we're going to close this chapter. We're turning the page. We're moving ahead. And, and in, in retrospect, I think that was clearly the right decision uh, on Ford's part to pardon Nixon. This is not the same situation, obviously, but are we digging ourselves in deeper as a country uh, by creating this, uh, I don't want to say sideshow, because that sort of prejudges the issue, but okay, so maybe he had some documents in the house in mar lago Maybe he covered it up. Maybe he said some stupid things. Maybe he did some stupid things. But is it worth it, given what it's doing to the country and uh, you know the public discourse and our our political life? I mean, any thoughts on that? Well, I think you have really put your your finger on the question. And I, I first, I fear it's too late. I think we've reached the point of no return uh, now with four pending criminal charges. Uh, and you can see signs of it already in terms of uh, the Hunter Biden case, for example, being uh, resurrected with the help of a judge who rejected a guilty plea, but, uh, and investigations now by the Republican majority in the House of uh, Democratic House members who participated in the various congressional investigations of Trump. You really do have to wonder, are we going to become Uh, like uh, these developing countries where the first thing the new administration does is throw the last one in jail or worse. Uh, And that would be a bad thing for the, for the Republic. You know, I yield to no one in my uh, program for Trump. uh, And, uh, you know, he is a a cartoon and a charlatan. Uh, But, uh, you know, having said that, maybe the opposite of, of, uh, love isn't hate, it's indifference. You know, I, I think, could we, could we just, you know, sort of cast him out to the cosmic void? Uh, I think that might be the worst punishment of all, but um, it remains to be seen. Well, it's been a fascinating and very informative discussion. So Steve, Rob, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate this. This is John Quinn, and this has been Law Disruptive.